ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you about something a bit serious. We're on the cusp of a new revolution after the Industrial Revolution. It's the quantum revolution. It's impossible to ignore that quantum computers are coming. And they are going to fundamentally change our lives in a multitude of ways. They're going to change the way that we understand ourselves. They're going to help us understand something called protein folding, which will enable us to deliver personalized medicine. They'll help us understand our planet. We can stop climate change, and we can even reduce CO2 emissions. And finally, because of the amount of data they can process, they'll help us understand our entire universe better by helping with the volume of data that's generated, for example, at CERN when we're trying to do the Large Hadron Collider experiments. So this is such a fundamental thing, it is impossible to ignore that no matter what else, quantum computers are coming. And now the, it begs the question, well, what are we going to do with it? You know, and how do they work? So a quantum computer, it differs fundamentally because it's using the principle of quantum mechanics to actually deliver us fundamental computing power. And it really starts with this idea of qubits. You guys are all familiar probably with bits, a binary system where we have a zero and one with our current computers. Everybody know the zero and one? Yep, good. Now, in quantum computers, we have this idea of quantum bits. And this is so phenomenally funky because it can basically be a zero and a one, like a coin, at the same time. And it stays that way unless it's measured or it's observed. So this is super cool. And you know, this observing thing is also a quite a phenomenon because it stays in this superposition state until there's an active role of the observer to actually figure out what's happening. There's a second thing which I find super romantic. And it's this principle of entanglement. And it means that we can entangle two qubits to each other, intimately connect them. And when we take a zero and one and we flip it over to a zero and one on the other side, we basically have this entangled pair. And where in a regular computer we had a zero or a one in this one space, if we entangle two qubits, we have a zero and a one and a zero and a one. We have four possibilities, where before we only had one. That's already pretty cool. But imagine that every time we want to double that computing power, all we need to do is add one more qubit, just one more qubit, and we can go from two to four to eight to 16. Just like that, it's an exponential rise. And it's so super cool that it changes the way that we understand computing power today. So if we examine, you know, what's the potential downside? If quantum computers are so great, why do we even care? Well, there is a really big downside because this major risk that we have to mitigate is around cybersecurity. All of our current security is based on cryptography that involves the multiplication of very large prime numbers. For those of you that have forgotten what the heck is a prime number again, I have a prime number sieve behind me that shows you all the prime numbers counting down. And the two difficult math problems we have in cryptography are integer factorization and discrete log. Always good to talk about this after dinner. So, Integer factorization and discrete log is basically, uh, these are both something called a one-way function. They're easy to do in one way, but difficult to reverse the other way. So if you imagine that we have a one-way function that allows us to multiply two numbers, pick, a, pick two numbers, like pick nine times eight. How much is nine times eight? 72. Okay, what are all the factors that we can multiply together to get me 72? Very good. And this is exactly, this is exactly the problem that our current computers also have. They know how to multiply these large primes, but given the actual product, they don't know how to reverse it. So the strength of a one-way function depends on the time you need to reverse it. So there are these two dudes, Peter Shore and Love Grover. They invented algorithms to do all of this work and break our crypto before there was even a quantum computer. And they're working with these problems to basically find solutions. And you know, 
if we had a quantum computer, it's basically a, a really fundamental challenge to keep our secrets still secret. So when we try to figure out how bad is it, and we want to evaluate the potential for power and threat of a quantum computer, we have to ask three basic questions. First question, how long do we need to keep our secrets secure? You might say, you know, my ABN AMRO account, that stuff, I don't really care. But you might feel differently when it comes to medical data. You might say, I want to keep my medical data secure for my lifetime. If it's DNA data, you might say, I want it also for the lifetime of my children. Yeah, so lifetimes are what we're thinking about in the length of time we want to keep our secret secret. The second question we need to ask is, how long before we have a viable quantum computer? Even when you speak to the, le not the least optimistic, but even the lesser optimists are in this field, they'll tell you that in about a decade, we will have a quantum computer that is capable of actually breaking those secrets. So if we say that decade is the time that we've got and we want to protect it for a lifetime, we've already got a problem. But then we bring around the third thing. So how long, the third question is, how long do we need to transition from our current technology would be broken by a quantum computer to new stuff that even with a quantum computer, we will have secrets that are unbreakable. And this is where we suck. We suck at change. We're not good at transitioning from something broken to something better. And this is where the predominant worry is. You know, we do have a solution, but it's gonna take some time. I'm gonna bring that up a, in a minute. So what I wanna tell you about is the fact that there's a small complexity here, which is that agencies, intelligence agencies all over the world like to gather and store your data. And they don't care if it's encrypted or unencrypted, they just want to store, capture, and collect. And when there is a quantum computer that's capable of breaking the encrypted stuff, cool, because old secrets are just as good as new secrets because of their predictive force. So this level of complexity means that everything you have ever transmitted or will transmit without some form of additional protection will be vulnerable to a quantum attack. And now that you have, you know, like this idea of background, it can get, especially when you're seeing this debate from the outside, without understanding all of the different complexities, it can be, you know, really difficult to understand what the heck is going on. And there's two groups, and this is what I really want to talk about. There are two groups in this thing that have solutions. One group are the cryptographers, and the other group are the physicists, and they both have what they think is a really good answer to this quantum computing threat. Problem is that from the outside, it looks like an argument between Edison and Tesla or Batman and Superman. Which side are you going to choose? However, when you're on the inside and you're a physicist or a cryptographer, it feels like one of you is Nancy Pelosi and the other one is clearly Donald Trump. And where you stand, on this issue depends on which camp you're actually sitting on. So let's take a look at one of the solutions from one of the camps, the physicists. So with physicists, you know, we, we, and with cryptographers, we also talk about this, this set of people, Alice and Bob, and Bob's ex-girlfriend, Eve. It's always about Eve, isn't it, ladies? So Eve is the interceptor. Eve wants to eavesdrop you know, uh, between the communication of Alice and Bob. She wants to know what is Bob sexting these days. So basically the idea is simple. When you uh, want to set up this secure communication channel, because Alice does not want Eve reading those messages, they have to set up a dedicated fiber link, a quantum channel between Alice and Bob. It's just a fiber link. How many of you have dedicated fibers between everyone you're communicating with? Talk to me afterwards. Um, <laughs> So if we want to take a look you know, at this fiber channel, how it really works between Alice and Bob, the idea is Eve can't get between this channel. If Eve does try to get between, remember I told you about the power of the observer, right? It exists in a superposition state until it gets observed. So when Eve does try to get in between, she changes it. What it really looks like is more like this. So we've got Alice on one side. We've got Bob on the other. Do you guys have polarized sunglasses? You know how when you hold it in one direction, in one angle, you let light through 
you hold it in another angle, it doesn't let the light through. Everybody knows? Yeah? So that's basically what this is. This is a very expensive set of polarized sunglasses. So we have diagonal and vertical polarizers, or horizontal and vertical polarizers, and basically Alice sends a single particle of light, a photon, through her set of horizontal and diagonal polarizers. She tells Bob how she set this up. So Bob has set it up the same way. So if Bob did this thing right, which we don't know, but if he did it right, right, that photon will get to Bob and there's no problem. However, if Eve is listening to this communication, she fucks it up and then Bob can't read it anymore. So then Alice you know, calls to Bob and says, right, did you get my message? And Bob will basically say, yeah, no, it was gibberish. One of two things happened. Either he screwed up or there was Eve. And that's how quantum key distribution or the solution for quantum cryptography works as according to the physicists. This is really amazing when you take this principle to scale and China did just that. They're not only working on a quantum computer, but they also built a very impressive 2,000 kilometer long quantum secure network from Beijing all the way to Shanghai. And they did this on discrete fiber pairs. So they basically set up a fiber with a maximum distance of 64 kilometers or 63 kilometers each way to a station and then set up a new connection. So it was Alice and Bob pairs all the way. So it's not end to end secure, but every hop is secure. And this is already pretty impressive because it took a lot of money to do that. But they didn't just stop there. They also launched a satellite into outer space that does encrypted video calls intercontinentally between China and, for example, Austria. How super cool is this? One caveat, doesn't always work with daylight uh, or if it rains, small problems. I mean, it never rains in the Netherlands. We never have to worry. So, but this is still very impressive, and this is impressive because of the amount of commitment, financial commitment by the Chinese government. They pour billions into this. In fact, they've poured over 10 billion into this per year, 10 milliard. Imagine how much you could do if we had that kind of money, because in Europe, we'd have a flagship of one billion over 10 years. They do 10 billion in one year. And in the US, the government commitment's not that strong, but private companies like IBM, Microsoft, Google, they're investing money to build a quantum computer and to have these types of technologies. So there is a race. To be frank, in the Netherlands, it's not like we're doing nothing because we are actually building our own initial part of building a total quantum internet, which means that instead of just having a few fiber connections between everyone you want to communicate to, this will actually be taken up to scale. And this is super cool because although we may not have the big bucks, we do have some very big brains working on this problem from the TU Delft. So we have Leo Kauhover, Ronald Hansen, Stephanie Vayner, all trying to figure out different solutions to these quantum challenges. And if we take it to the other camp, the cryptographer's camp, there are also really major efforts there. And don't forget, with a minimum amount of financial resources, if you've got two computing solutions, you've got to figure out which one are you going to pick. So the cryptographers believe that the only thing that's scalable across the internet without having to set up dedicated fiber links is an algorithmic solution. So having a new set of algorithms that even with a quantum computer, it will still be secure. That would be awesome. And they're probably only done with that by 2024, even though they started in 2016. And you know, there will still be attacks, but this is looking very robust. And frankly, I think the real solution is somewhere in the middle. I think we need a phased plan of attack. We need to first calm down, take a look at the current cryptography we've got and make it as difficult as possible, even with a quantum computer to try to attack it by using it to its maximum potential, which in this case, it means size matters. We need to have really big keys, uh, which come at a computational and bandwidth cost, but we need to have really big keys for our current cryptography. Then we need to examine very specific cases for using quantum key distribution or the physicist's solution. And then when it's ready and available, or even before, if we can already start playing with it, we should take a look at these post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. If we play now 
when the time comes that there actually is a quantum computer, it'll be easier for us to transition. Awesome sauce. I'm also excited about quantum computers, and I think we should be able to enjoy all of their potential benefits, but only if we mitigate any potential security concerns. So I hope that you will agree with me that true security or defense in depth means embracing both the physics solution as well as the cryptographic solution at the same time. Thank you very much.